do so quietly, please. The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 11539 in the name of Mark Ruskell on civil contingency in nuclear weapon transport. And this debate will be concluded without any question being put. Uh, would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Mark Ruskell to open the debate for around seven minutes, please, Mr Ruskell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking members who have signed the motion for this debate. I know many like Bill Kidd have been champions of nuclear disarmament throughout their political careers. Personally, I started campaigning on, on this issue when I briefly helped to detain a nuclear convoy in Stirling back in the 1990s. But this isn't a debate tonight about the campaign for nuclear disarmament, supportive as I am. It is a debate about the responsibilities that come with maintaining a nuclear deterrent and whether we are discharging those responsibilities in line with the law. And I'd like to pay tribute in particular to David McKenzie, Jane Talents, and their network of citizen monitors in Newt Watch UK, as well as the investigative journalism of Rob Edwards, which has been so critical to exposing the failings over many years. And I was pleased to help out with Jane and David's recent report on Ready Scotland, which analyzes the critical gap in our response to the transport of nuclear weapons in Scotland. Presiding officer, convoys run between Coolport Naval Base and the atomic weapon plants in Berkshire around eight times a year. And apart from the odd training run, they generally carry nuclear warheads for maintenance or replacement, consisting of radioactive plutonium and uranium alongside explosives. Under civil regulations, it is, of course, illegal to carry explosives together with radioactive material, not so in a military convoy. And the MOD admit that a detonation of the explosive would have an impact radius of 600 meters with a dispersal of radioactive material over at least five kilometers, potentially even further, depending on prevailing winds. Now, the convoy routes are well known, and the advent of social media has meant it really is the UK's worst kept secret. In Stirling, they park up at the Defence Support Group barracks in Forthside, behind a flimsy chain-link fence next to a Nando's and the View Cinema. It really is a disaster movie waiting to happen. They regularly run by Stirling Castle, passing bemused tourists, and then onto the A811 through Arne Pryor and Baclayevy and onwards. Now, the risk of a catastrophic incident is mercifully small, but the impact of a serious accident or terrorist attack, should it happen, could be devastating. And, of course, even a low probability over many years and decades is a persistent risk. The consequences of such an incident are likely to be considerable loss of life and severe disruption both to the British people's way of life and to the UK's ability to function as a sovereign state. Now, that sounds like hyperbole, presiding officer, but these are not my words. These are the words of the Ministry of Defence themselves revealed through a, feed, a, through a Freedom of Information request back in 2006. Now, of course, all decisions of the UK's defence policy, the operation and renewal of Trident are fully reserved to Westminster. Even the event of a convoy incident, the responsibility to secure and contain the site would lie with MOD personnel. But managing the impact beyond the immediate vicinity of the convoy would primarily be the responsibility of councils and emergency services in their roles as Category 1 responders under the Civil Contingencies Act and with Scottish Government holding responsibility for compliance under that Act. Now, replacing the old Civil Defence Act, the CCA brought in a new approach requiring civil authorities to identify potential threats, examine the risks, and list them on public registers while ensuring the public has appropriate information to respond should contingency plans ever have to be enacted. Now, there are two main opt-outs under the CCA which identify when authorities don't need to inform the public. Firstly, if national security could be compromised through sharing sensitive information, and secondly, if information was likely to cause public alarm. Now, providing live information about convoys would, of course, be inappropriate. But as I've already said, the existence of convoys is not a secret. They park next to Anandos. And the culture of secrecy surrounding the convoys and a failure to acknowledge and plan for the risks is in itself cause for public alarm. The admission by Police Scotland officers under oath during the trial of a protester last year that they had no idea about what is contained in the convoys really alarms me. I want my emergency services to have a clear idea of what they would be dealing with. 
And there's also a starkly inconsistent approach in the level of public information provided about radiation hazards around the Clyde naval bases and the dearth of information provided on the nuclear warhead convoys. Under the radiation emergency regulations, residents surrounding the bases are informed every three years with just enough information to prepare them should an incident ever occur. Threats are listed under local resilience partnership risk registers for naval bases and civil nuclear power stations. So in 2016, I asked local authorities on convoy routes what risk assessments had been completed, and the answer was none. Neither had any councils communicated with the public about the potential threat. So councils are clearly breaching the responsibilities they have under the CCA to assess risk, plan, and inform. Several of the council surveys surveyed didn't even seem to be aware that they had convoys running through their areas. If councils are relying on generic risk assessments produced by resilience partnerships, then that's really concerning because convoys pose a unique set of risks, explosives and nuclear material traveling together. And if they're relying on the MOD for risk assessment, again, that should concern us because these assessments, even if they exist, are not available and the MOD has no role beyond dealing with containment at a convoy incident site. A number of councils pointed to guidelines produced by the MOD about what to do in the event of a convoy incident, but it's clear that there are huge challenges for first responders to follow the guidelines on a range of issues from communications to cordon access. For example, no evacuation procedure on the scale of a 600 meter cordon has been planned or trialed in Scotland. And the guidelines for providing shelter from radioactive material within five kilometers also pays, pose major problems. They require people to stay indoors and for ventilation systems to be shut down. Do hospitals know this? They require school children to be kept indoors and not picked up. Do schools know about this? Can I turn just very briefly in, in closing, presiding officer, to the role here of the Scottish Government? So far, the response to Unready Scotland report has been very disappointing. The position of the Government on Trident, although welcome, is largely irrelevant to this debate. The issue here is about dealing with the responsibilities we have here and now under the current devolution settlement. And I've hopefully demonstrated that resilience partnerships are woefully ill-prepared to deal with a convoy incident and are failing to discharge their legal duties under the Civil Contingencies Act. Only a review headed up by the Scottish Government involving the MOD, COSLA, Police Scotland, the Fire and Rescue Service, the NHS and expert stakeholders can start to address the failings. That is the call on the Government tonight and nothing less will do. Um, may I say to those of the public gallery, I would prefer it if you didn't show appreciation or otherwise during the debate. Thank you very much. We move to the open debate and quite a lot of requests to speak, so speeches of um, quite a strict four minutes, please. Um, Bill Kidd to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I won't even have to take four minutes because I've just got something which I think is important to say. Um, uh, first of all, though, I would like to congratulate and thank Mark Ruskell uh, for achieving this important members' debate here today. I'd like to declare an interest in the subject of the debate as convener of the Cross-Party Group on Nuclear Disarmament and internationally as a co-president of Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. It was in that role that last July I was the only elected representative of anybody in the UK to attend the United Nations Conference which passed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Sadly, not even the UK's appointed ambassador attended the conference. 122 nations, though, voted in favour of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons with one against and one abstention. And while there, I presented a statement of support for this historic treaty from our First Minister to the President of the conference, it reiterated the Scottish Government's call for a world free of nuclear weapons. With our contribution to be led by Scotland having Trident removed from our land and waters as quickly and safely as possible. Therefore, I'm confident that the Scottish Government takes the issue of nuclear weapons seriously. And I know that they take the issue at hand of Ministry of Defence convoys transporting high explosives and radioactive materials along public roads very seriously. And it's this very issue, the transport of these materials by the MOD convoys, which needs to be addressed by both Holyrood and Westminster. 
in assessing the preparedness of areas in Scotland and England through which these convoys travel, from Burfield in the south of England to Faz Lane in Argyll. No one should be ignorant of what these convoys are carrying past their homes and communities or of the potential dangers posed by an accident or an incident. So to that end, I would ask that the Minister may look at the Scottish Government's setting up of a group with the specific remit of conducting an open review of the readiness of all of those Scottish areas through which the nuclear weapons convoys travel in order to ensure civil contingency preparedness across the board. I believe that this should be done in order to ensure the defence of our population, our environment and the futures of our young people along every route of these despicable convoys. Until that is, we achieve the removal of Trident from our country. Thank you very much for listening. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Before I begin, I'd like to declare that I was a, well, I was a soldier in our armed forces, and I served in the 1980s and 1990s during the Cold War and in Germany. When nuclear weapons formed part of the USSR's offensive plan and thus had to form part of NATO's strategic defense plan. And before anyone asks if I was happy with that, my response is that I believe that the deterrents do work. And I accept that many in this chamber, including Mark Ruskell, will probably not agree with me, but I respect their opinion and I hope they will respect mine. Now, I've listened carefully to the concerns raised by Mark Ruskell and question where he got his information from, because the information that I have is very different. And I'd like to run through that information, if I may, looking at the nuclear facts as I understand them. Fact one, when nuclear weapons are transported, they're not armed and ready to explode. They're actually transported in a manner that means they are fully contained and inert. Their transport containers are designed. Well, can I just finish this point, uh, Mr. Finney, and then I'll, before I go on to fact two, I'll bring you in. Uh, they are designed to be robust and they're sealed. And the UK government stated in 2015 weapons are transported in a benign configuration and in secured custom design containers that it is tested in accordance with international atomic energy standards to protect against a range of scenarios including impact on a motorway at speed, drop from height, fuel fire, amongst other threats. Mr Finney, I'm delighted to give away. John Finney. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Unless I missed it, are you able to say what, what the source of that information is, please, Mr Mountain? Yes, uh, that, can that, I remind members to always speak through the chair? Oh, sorry. And I call sorry, Edward Mountain. That information came from a UK government statement that was delivered in 2015, and there are various papers from the UK Parliament relating to the transportation of nuclear weapons. As far as uh, fact two, I should turn on to now, nuclear weapons are inherently stable as they're carried. They're not like, as many people believe, old explosives like nitroglycerine. They don't explode when subject to either heat, shock, or flame. They're stable and basically benign when they're transported, as I've said. And providing they are well maintained, which our weapons are, there is no risk of exposure to the materials that they're made from. Fact three. When nuclear weapons are transported, the physical security is extremely high. You and I will never know the extent of that security, and nor should we. What I do know is that what you see is what you're meant to see, and what you don't see, you're not meant to see until it's needed. And that is based on the evidence that I have from when I was a soldier and I was involved in, and, uh, in moving nuclear weapons in, in Germany. Fact four. New contingency plans are extremely high and involves all the key services, military and civilian. I know they're in place and I know their practice. And to be clear, all civil authorities are consulted before nuclear weapon convoys begin their journey. Fact five, transportation of nuclear weapons through residential areas is rigorously assessed and governed tightly by international and national regulations. Presiding officer. Transporting nuclear weapons and materials by road in the UK has been taking place for more than 50 years. And in that time, there has never been an incident and that has presented either a risk to the public or indeed the environment. So whilst I respect Mr. Russell's opinion, 
I'm afraid I don't agree with it. What I do say is let's argue on the facts and let's not argue on anything else and let's stick to those facts while we're having this debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Claire Hawkey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My thanks go to Mark Ruskell for bringing this issue to the Chamber today and to Nuke Watch UK for its consistent work on this issue and also to Rob Edwards and to many others. I commend those members of the public dedicating time to this issue. It is often civilian watchdogs that hold our governments to account on these guarded issues. And I should also declare an interest as a member of the CPG for nuclear disarmament. While we still have weapons of mass destruction in this country, and the requirement to transport them throughout, it would seem absolutely obvious that every aspect and every eventuality would be planned for robustly and consistently. Inconceivably, this has been revealed not to be the case. And un the Unready Scotland report shows that the routes and that warhead convoys take and many of the communities I represent across the south of Scotland are affected by this. I'm disappointed to say that there are no nuclear-free local authorities at the moment in South Scotland. The Scottish Government has, of course, a responsibility for community safety and emergency planning. In my view, I have concerns, as have some of my constituents, about a failure to ensure compliance with the local authority, of local authorities under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, and it is a failure to, to, uh, to put people at risk, both communities and indeed the emergency services. While an accident is indeed unlikely, there are a series of credible scenarios that could trigger fire explosions and the, the breach of containment with plutonium. And I, and I would uh, differ from um, my colleague Edward Mountain on this, and the breach of containment and other radioactive materials possibly leaking from warheads. And I, and I don't want to be alarmist about this, but, um, uh, but that is the case. There are these possibilities. Before the reports became entirely redacted in 2015, the Ministry of Defense reports were concerning. In 2006, it reported the convoy crew fatigue could cause hazards. In 2010, the risk of accident was getting progressively worse due to spending cuts. And in 2014, it reported a shortage of engineers as a threat to safety. These are, of course, questions for the UK government, but it, is, it seriously highlights the need for our government in Scotland, the Scottish government, to ensure we are prepared. This is a unique threat for our emergency services who would be the first to be likely to be on the scene. And I do fear this fa failure of transparency as well as legal compliance that the general information on these convoys is not made public. There are obvious reasons why this should not be made widespread and, given, and up to the, the minute information given. But national security surely does not justify a failure to inform the public about the existence of convoys. We all have a democratic right to know. And I welcome the comment from the Scottish Government on rail convoys. Um, I would welcome a comment from the Scottish Government on rail convoys, which also passed through my constituency. The Ministry of Defence says that the risk of nuclear weapons, and I quote, nuclear weapons convoys are tolerable when balanced against the strategic imperative to move nuclear weapons. While nuclear we weapons remain in the UK and across the world, these ugly judgments will have to be made. Nuclear weapons are not someone else's problem. They are utterly inhumane, militarily useless, by, as stated by many senior military figures, and morally acceptable and unacceptable and, in my view, illegal. And Scottish Labour has recognised this in 2015. But this is not a debate about nuclear weapons. It is about the safety of their transportation. And all with responsibility need support and the civil res um, resilience partnerships uh, need to be well interlinked. And I ask the, uh, the minister in closing remarks to highlight how this is being done. Uh, not in detail, of course, for national security reasons. We all need to be able to reassure our constituents that while nuclear warheads are trafficked through their areas, they're as safe as can possibly be. And I thank Mark Ruskell not only for his work, but for his wise words and information. And I call alongside him and many others in this chamber and beyond uh, for the Scottish Government to consider the open review 
for, of the preparedness of Scottish civil authorities to deal with serious nuclear weapon convoy incidents. The Scottish Government must act on this and show the people of Scotland it is acting. Thank you. I call Claire Hawkey to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I would also like to add my thanks to Mark Ruskell for bringing this very important debate to the Chamber today. It's also a pleasure to speak after my colleague Bill Kidd, who undoubtedly speaks with a greater authority than most on this subject. Um, and as Bill Kidd made clear, we in the SNP are resolute in our position that nuclear weapons are abhorrent, they're financially unjustifiable, and they do not protect us against the modern threats we face today. These weapons of mass destruction have no place on our planet. They have no right to be housed in Scotland, and they should in no way be transported on our busy roads. A little under three years ago, my previous Rutherglen Westminster colleague, Margaret Ferrier, held a debate on the transportation of nuclear weapons in the UK Parliament. As she outlined then from research conducted by Nuke Watch, nuclear warheads were transported through the Rutherglen constituency at least three times between January 2014 and January 2015. On these occasions, the weapons were moved in large convoys of around 20 vehicles travelling across the M74 through my constituency and then on to Glasgow city centre. Presiding officer, trucks carrying nuclear material can be on our motorways or main roads at any time of the day or night, all without residents on the route ever knowing. Most recent figures collated by Nuke Watch show that the number of Trident warheads being transported to and from the Clyde has increased fivefold between 2015 and 2016. And as such, it's very likely that nuclear weapons have continued to be moved within my constituency and at a more frequent rate than previously imagined. Members will be aware of the Ministry of Defence's document entitled Local Authority and Emergency Services Information, which outlines the many council areas across the UK which the nuclear convoys may travel through. This report names 21 of the 32 local authorities in Scotland, including South Lanarkshire, Glasgow City, Edinburgh City and North Lanarkshire. As Mark Ruskell's motion correctly points out, no information relating to an incident involving nuclear weapons is available to communities along the regular convoy route. It's frightening to think that if an incident does take place, then our authorities would be so poorly prepared to take swift action. We're incredibly lucky that in the 50 years nuclear weapons have been transported no major incidents have occurred. However, there have been a number of near misses. For example, in 2007, several vehicles in a convoy were separated and became lost in the Stirling area due to heavy fog. It was reported that it took several hours for the convoy to regroup. And in that time, anything could have happened to their cargo. However, such problems aren't new. 30 years prior to this, in 1987, two vans, each driving with two nuclear warheads, came off the road after slipping on ice. Fortunately, the weapons were not damaged in this accident, but it took the authorities around 18 hours to recover the vehicles. These weapons should not be in transit in the first place, and especially not during challenging weather conditions. The Ministry of Defence themselves admitted in 2016 that in the three previous years, 43 safety incidents were reported to them. Accidents can and do happen, and the risk the UK government continue to take is not a risk worth taking. Presiding officer, in summing up, I wish to repeat the calls made by other members here today. The people of Scotland, Civic Scotland, the STUC, Scotland's churches, the Scottish Parliament and the majority of Scotland's MPs do not want to see the Trident nuclear weapon system renewed. If we want our constituencies to be clear of nuclear weapons, then I suggest we all urge the UK government to scrap its nuclear obsession. Before I move on to, to Gordon MacDonald, um, I've noted that um, there's still quite a few members wish to speak. So I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. May I ask uh, Mark Ruskell to move that motion? Uh, does the Chamber agree that the debate should be extended? That's then agreed. And I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I also thank Mark Ruskell for securing this important debate. And it is an important debate for the communities that I represent, as up to eight times a year, 
a convoy of army vehicles carrying nuclear warheads and weapon materials uses the Edinburgh bypass as they travel between Coolport, where the UK's nuclear weapons are stored, and Burrowfield Atomic Weapons Plant in Berkshire, where they undergo maintenance, refurbishment or decommissioning. On Monday, March the 26th, the second nuclear convoy of this year travelled along the Edinburgh Bypass through my constituency, just yards from communities from the Calders in the West, past Barberton Mains, Juniper Green, Benali, Torfin, Collington, Oxgangs, Swanston to Fair Mile Head in the East. Yet the people who live there have never received any information on what to do in the event of an accident involving, involving transported nuclear weapons. The convoys carry radioactive material consisting of plutonium and uranium, and in the event of an accident, has a potential dispersal range of at least three miles, requiring a total evacuation of almost all of my constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands, including schools, a college, and two universities. Now, this isn't just some hypothetical issue raising unnecessary fears. Edinburgh Council was the lead authority in 2005 when Exercise Senator took place, simulating damage to a convoy transporting a nuclear warhead on the Edinburgh bypass, resulting in a theoretical release of radiological material over a wide, Edinburgh, a wide area of Edinburgh. The Council again took part in a similar exercise in 2011 in North Lanarkshire, simulating an accident involving a nuclear convoy. In addition, a report by the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, compiled using freedom of information requests into military convoys carrying nuclear weapons, highlighted that 180 mishaps and incidents, including collisions, breakdowns and brake failures, have occurred during the last 16 years. Thankfully, none of the incidents have resulted in a release of radioactive materials. Yet, despite the Council taking part in two exercises and the reported potential dangers, the City of Edinburgh Council, in a response to a survey carried out in 2016 by Mark Ruskell, admitted that they had, and I quote, not carried out an independent assessment of the risks to council residents specifically relating to the transportation of nuclear weapons, and that they had not communicated with its public in regard to risks associated specifically with the transport of nuclear weapons. The Scottish Government has a resilience division that supports organisations to work together to build Scotland's resilience to emergencies with staff based in Edinburgh, Perth and Glasgow. Their website, Ready Scotland, explains there are three regional resilience partnerships which are broken down into 12 local resilience partnerships. These groups bring together all organisations in an area to develop an effective approach to dealing with emergencies. They have robust plans in place to respond to all kinds of events. These plans are regularly tested in joint exercises and during real emergencies. However, on searching the website, there was no reference to nuclear accidents involving MOD vehicles. So why is this? Well, the UK, the UK Armed Forces Minister highlighted in a Westminster Hall debate in 2015 that the Scottish Government and local authorities are not given advance notice of convoys and that the Radiation Emergency Preparedness and Public Information Regulations 2001 only apply to areas surrounding nuclear sites and do not apply to road transport. In addition, legislation passed by the UK Government back in 2004, the Civil Contingencies Act, places constraints on any authority's ability to keep the public informed. The first is to avoid conveying sensitive information, covering information deemed harmful to national security or public safety, and the second is to avoid alarming the public unnecessarily. As the House of Commons Library stated in the briefing on nuclear convoys, the MOD is reluctant to give too much information about the transportation of nuclear material. 
And this veil of secrecy and the UK Parliament Acts and regulations make it virtually impossible, in my view, for any local authority or the Scottish Government to prepare for a nuclear accident. Presiding officer, if we can't prepare properly for a potential nuclear accident, let's ban the transportation of nuclear warheads as a first step towards removing weapons of mass destruction from Scotland. You know, just because we've got an extra 30 minutes doesn't mean it has to be all used up. <laughs> Having said that, you can have a, a little bit extra time, Maurice Corey, in the interest of fairness. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I thank Mark Russell for, for, beginning, for bringing this member's debate to the Chamber. It is an important issue and it's something we do need to discuss. Although I know I'll never agree particularly with Mark Russell um, on the wider issue of nuclear weapons and the vital role they play in preserving world peace, I'm sure he knows that he will not get me to agree with his position on nuclear weapons either. But I do thank him for bringing forward this debate. Uh, I must declare an interest. I, I live in Helensborough, five miles from Fast Lane, born and bred there, so I'm fully aware of many of the comments that people have made in this debate so far. Um, I will start by talking about something I agree with him on, though, and that is that the local and civil authorities should consider the transporting of nuclear weapons on roads through their areas. These bodies should to risk assess the potential for danger to the public as part of their wider contingency planning procedures. And I'm sure that the response from that work would find the risk to the public to be low or negligible. I don't agree with Mark Ruskell's motion that the transporting of nuclear weapons is, inherent, is an inherent risk. If done safely, as it is done in this country, I know that the public have nothing to fear. I think that it is important to note that there has never been an accident involving nuclear, defense nuclear material in the UK that has led to or come anywhere near leading to the release of radioactive material into the environment. Addition yes. Oh. Alison Johnson. Thank you. The member's contribution and that of Mr Mountain before him seem to suggest that because there's never been an accident, there never will be an accident. Does he not um, believe in the precautionary principle and we must make sure that communities are as well prepared as they possibly can be in the event of such a horrendous occurrence? Maurice Corey. Um, thank you. I couldn't possibly disagree with that. Uh, it is important to note... Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, it is important to note that... There's, sorry. Uh, additionally, Mr. Mark Ruskell's motion speaks of who would be responsible to respond to an accident, and I think the motion gives the impression that local and civil authorities would be left to their own devices. Following on from my colleague Edward Mountain earlier, we should take note that embedded with every convoy is an immediate response force, or IRF, who are specifically trained to deal with these situations, and also that the convoy commander would take over as the incident coordinator and would be in charge of coordinating the response. This means that at an incident, there would immediately be sufficient equipment and trained personnel to, al to alert and brief the police, fire and ambulance services to assess whether or not there has been a release of radioactive material and to assist the police in establishing an initial safety and security zone. Additional measures that are to be put in place would include trained personnel for coordination with the police in providing information for the media and the public, and the media very strongly here. Uh, convoy personnel are also cross-trained to enable them to undertake other roles. That, of course, is just at the site itself. Yes? Mark Ruskell. Can, can, can I thank the member for, for giving way on that point? And I, I do acknowledge the resources and the expertise of the personnel that the MOD would have in connection with the convoy. However, this debate is about the Civil Contingencies Act and what happens beyond the immediate site of the convoy in the 600 metre cordon, which would require evacuation, in the five kilometre zone where schools and hospitals would have to shut down. That's the bit which is the devolved responsibility. Maurice Corley. I appreciate that. I'm just coming to that. That, of course, is just at the site itself. Um, on a wider national level, every time a convoy is moving, a joint operations cell, or JOC, monitors all road movements of defence nuclear material and will activate any additional response needed to support the IRF. The JOC would contact the police immediately in the event of an emergency and provide them with the precautionary public protection advice and to discuss any additional support requirements. And this includes going further out in the boundaries that Mark Ruskell has just spoken about in his intervention to me just now. In terms of the contingency planning by local and civil authorities, I do think the Ministry of Defence deserves some credit in this area. 
It has made information available on what actions should be taken by local authorities and emergency services in creating named documents such as the ones referred to earlier on, which is a local authority's emergency service information. And in my hand here, I also have an example when I was a councillor with Argyll and Butte Council, where we actually had a thing called the Clyde Le Local Liaison Committee, which met annually. Uh, it had also a calendar of emergency exercises, which are now going from 2018 to 2023. And these are addressing the areas you're talking about beyond the Clyde Base, for example, beyond five miles, beyond 10 miles. And having myself been trained as a nuclear um, instructor, a uh, defence instructor in the Army, uh, I'm well aware of how these things can progress. And so there is exercises which go forward. And in Argyll and Butte, in relation to HM Naval Base Clyde, they hold annually the exercise Evening Star, and they also hold a larger scale exercise called Exercise Short Sermon, and that's held every three years. Now, those include the local residents as well as local uh, community councillors, councillors, and indeed members of parliament. Yes. Very quickly, please indulgence for giving way yet again however that is the point though why do we not have that kind of approach to civil contingency that we have around the naval bases in relation to the convoys we don't have that with the convoys we do have it around naval bases in the in the Clyde Maurice Corey uh, <clears throat> well that's a fair point um, I, I think probably in Argyll and Butte we've been very used to this and, and certainly it's something I would certainly commend to the Minister if they want to go and look at what happens in those two exercises because we do address the question of incoming and outgoing convoys as well. Okay. Um, the JOC will contact the police immediately in the event of emergency um, and provide them with the precautionary public protection advice. The public protection advice which means the areas out with the areas of that. So if you take an incident to be convoys as well you, apart from the base situation, for example, an overheated reactor on a nuclear submarine which goes red, basically, and that's sometimes how the exercises are performed, then you could do the same process. So there's no reason why you can't transform, Mr. Ruskell, that to the convoys, and, and I certainly go along with that. Uh, in terms of contingency planning, um, as I say, the... Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, I'm on the wrong page there. Uh, in terms of the engagement that the document from the local and civil authorities, from my experience in the with the Ministry of Defence in supporting local government, will be open and willing to engage with contingency planning officers in the local authority areas, not just in this area of one place, but also with convoys, and also in addressing other planning issues. I think one of the problems is that as elected councillors move on, the, sometimes the collective memory is lost. Um, so a lot is actually... Um, imposed on the emergency planning officers in each local authority and as far as I'm aware they're the ones who really should keep the council up to date and provide the, um, the, the necessary planning. In conclusion Deputy Presiding Officer I do think there is an, this is an area where local and civil authorities can improve uh, but I believe that the current arrangements of transporting nuclear uh, defence material is actually safe and that the public should hold no fears about it. But I think we need to look and progress on what are done in certain areas like Argyll and Butte, which I know quite a lot about. Thank you. Call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Tom Arthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And like others, I'd like to warmly congratulate Matt, Matt Ruskell for bringing this important debate to the Chamber this evening. I'd also like to thank Nuke Watch UK for an interesting an important report on Steady Scotland, which highlights the dangers that communities are put in by these nuclear weapons convoys. Communities in places in my constituency, like the city of Stirling, Gorgonic, Arn Pryor, Buclivy, and Drimmon. The presiding officer, one of the reasons I joined the SNP now too many years ago to remember was because of their strong ethos and op opposition to nuclear weapons. So tonight I could talk about the eye-watering amount that the UK government has committed to spending on these status symbols at a time of austerity. I could talk about the moral absurdity of considering using nuclear weapons and the fact that today they are strategically more useless than they've ever been at any time in history. But this debate is an opportunity to highlight the everyday danger they present to the people who live in ordinary communities in Scotland, especially in my constituency, who amongst others have Trident weapons convoys passing through their area on a regular basis. Now, any accident or terror attack involving these warheads, particularly through, with a convoy through populated areas, poses a potential serious risk to public safety, not to mention the potential long-term health and environmental damage that the radioactive poison contained in a Trident nuclear warhead could inflict. Of course, the presence of nuclear 
convoys through peaceful communities of the Stirling area encourages protest. And just last year, a man was fined £200 for lying underneath a Trident truck in Stirling. So much for security. What a terrifying prospect. A regular member of the public can actually get up and touch one of these and interfere with its progress. As the Nuke Watch report points out, no risk acceptability gap exists between civil transport and nuclear weapons convoys is vast. Now, Mark Ruskell touched on this particular matter. Civilian vehicles are prohibited from carrying explosives in conjunction with radioactive material. The reason these restrictions clearly been due to the level of heightened danger. Yet, the risk of an attack or accident in relation to a Trident convoy does not prohibit them from per being permitted to carry radioactive substances inside missile warheads. Now, with an estimated eight nuclear convoys travelling throughout Scotland a year, the Nuke Watch report questions how ready our country is for a major incident involving them. But I think my question is in this, how ready can we really be? These things can never be safe as long as they travel through local towns and villages. They will always pose a potential threat to safety. And as the report itself points out, assessing a risk means that we combine the likeness of an event with the severity of its impact. Now, even if the likeliness was to be reduced to an insignificant amount, the severity of an accident involving nuclear warheads is so great, the risk remains very high, whether it's happened or not in the past. This is about the future and what could happen. Interestingly, the response from Stirling Council to a consultation forming part of this report suggested that nuclear convoys are arguably less at risk during times of rest stop at MOD Forthside in Stirling City. Can I say to Mark uh, Ruskell, never mind the Nando's and the view, my office is much, much closer to these ba that base than these particular fantastic establishments are. It makes obvious sense that obviously if the MOD facility presents a far less risk of an attack than a public road does. However, the, gov the UK government are set to close MOD foreside entirely in 2022. Where will these convoys be expected to rest stop thereafter? What will the findings of such a risk assessment be then? President Officer, I'm seriously concerned about nuclear convoys travelling through my constituency as well as other parts of the country. But what does the future look like? Once the closure of MOD sites like Fourth Sides takes place, how can these convoys stop, continue to operate uh, and include re secure rest stops? Will the goalposts be simply moved again to make the risk more acceptable in these circumstances? In closing, these are very hard questions I've put directly to the MOD ahead of today's debate and I look forward to a detailed response from them as soon as possible on this important matter. There is one thing absolutely certain though, the best way to reduce the risk posed by transportation of nuclear weapons is to rid ourselves of these obscenities once and for all. The last two contributions in the open debate are from Tom Arthur, followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in this debate. I'd like to begin by thanking Mark Ruskell for bringing this um, important issue to the Chamber row. I don't think I'll ever look at a Nando's in quite the same way again after this. It certainly does have a quality of a disaster movie. And I was particularly struck by Mr. Ruskell making reference to bemused tourists. Clearly, we want to encourage as many people to come to Scotland as possible, but that's one tourist attraction we can be doing without. I would like to uh, pick up on a couple of points that have been raised previously um, over the course of this debate. Um, and I'm sure Mr. Mountain will correct me if I, I misheard him, but I understood that he stated that all civil authorities are, are informed, but actually there is no, as I understand it, obligation for local authorities to be informed of nuclear transportations that are occurring. And I say that because I was in contact with Renfrewshire Council this afternoon. Um, my constituency of Renfrewshire South does not have a nuclear convoy pass directly through it. However, as it makes its journey west, towards um, the Erskine Bridge on the MA, it passes nearby. Now, I've certainly been in touch with, um, as I say, Renfrewshire Council. Um, I want to also at this moment commend Nuke Watch on their work, though I don't think they received a response from Renfrewshire Council in their report, if I recall correctly. Um, 
I'm sure Mr. Russell will correct me if I am wrong, but having spoken to Renfrewshire Council, they have been very clear to me that they take their responsibilities as a Category 1 responder very seriously and, in, and indeed seek to work collaboratively with Category 2 responders. But I certainly think what I will take from this debate is to look to engage directly um, with my colleagues in the local authority to make sure that they are up to date. I think that the, the question that's raised um, from, from this in regards to the devolved competencies is do we have to have a, a refresh and a relook or a review of existing procedures on the one hand and also should members of the public be informed and I'm about a generation that was, bo you know, um, was born close towards the end of the Cold War I did not grow up with the, the, the persistent threat of the mushroom cloud and nuclear Armageddon, though given recent political developments over the past few months, perhaps um, my generation will experience that uh, threat. But certainly, uh, f for there was a piece of language that um, Mark Riscoe used, um, civil defence, and obviously used civil contingencies now. Uh, but the idea of civil defence and being aware of the risk of um, nuclear war and what to do in these particular situations it was something I was second nature to my parents generation but but not not to mine and I think with that there has been perhaps a commensurate decrease in awareness of the risks posed by nuclear weapons being housed in Scotland so I think what potentially steps going forward I'll be interested to hear what the minister um, has to say in responding as if there is a need to look and refresh civil contingency measures, certainly even just to increase awareness um, amongst parliamentarians, amongst members of um, uh, local authorities, a point that um, uh, Mr. Corey raised, which I think was uh, very valid. Um, certainly, many of the councillors in my authority are probably closer to my age and may not have the same recollection um, of, of that particular uh, threats of a bygone age. Um, but I, I would be um, very keen to, to hear what the Minister has to say as regards to if there is a need for a refresh, if it is actually just a question of making people more aware, um, but without necessarily um, being alarmist. Um, I think just in, in concluding as regards to my own constituency, there are specific concerns because clearly we have Glasgow Airport um, on the doorstep um, in Renfrewshire. Um, and clearly any event that were to occur, which were to, be, to result in um, extended periods of you know, closures of the M8 or surrounding roads could have a, a massive disruption. So I would be quite keen to hear what the Minister has to say in response to these concerns and what um, action, if any, the Government seeks to take. Thank you. I'm more interested in how you're going to justify accusing me of being from a bygone age. <laughs> And I call on Ross Greer. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and thanks to my colleague Mark Rusko and to Nukewatch for the work they've done in uh, preparing the Unready Scotland report. This report lays bare the, the danger these nuclear weapons convoys pose to communities who the convoy routes pass through, but also the communities such as in Tom Arthur's constituency that they pass close by to. And it shows the inadequacies in preparation by local authorities who, in many cases, don't seem to realise, either through genuine misunderstanding or through a deliberate attempt to, to evade, uh, that they have a clear responsibility, as Mark Rusko has outlined. We should be absolutely clear what these convoys contain, why there is a risk, and who, where the responsibility lies. They're transporting nuclear warheads, both the dangerous radioactive materials and the explosives required in combination to create a viable weapon of mass destruction. The immediate risk is not in the detonation of one of the warheads. Edward Mountain is right to highlight that it's exceptionally hard, almost impossible, to genuinely detonate a nuclear bomb by accident. The risk, though, is that either as a result of accident or by attack on a convoy, we could face what equates to the most powerful and dangerous dirty bomb imaginable. An accident involving one of these convoys risks releasing radioactive material and dispersing it into the surrounding area. An immediate area of 600 metres could be contaminated. One could carry the radioactive particles a further five kilometres. And many people would suggest that that's actually a conservative estimate of how far it would carry. Any release, any release at all of radioactive particles would be devastating to local communities and to Scotland and the UK as a whole. Yet most people are not even aware that these convoys pass through our cities, our towns and our villages. They're entirely unaware that they drive down their own street. Upon leaving Fastlane Naval Base in Helensborough in my region, the convoys often travel to the A82. That takes them through Balloch, Alexandria, Dumbarton, all the way to the Erskine Bridge onto the M8. From there, they travel along the M8, passing by Paisley and Renfrew in the south side of Glasgow. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people within the danger zones. 
They travel through a number of local authorities, Argyll and Butte, Western Bartonshire, Renfrewshire, as well as close to the border of Eastern Bartonshire, where they return to the M80. And these journeys take place half a dozen times a year, sometimes a couple more. And what's really worrying is the inconsistency in how prepared our local councils are to deal with an accident and the potential release of radioactive material. No local authorities, none at all, have carried out specific risk assessments for the convoys, which they should. But some seem unable to explain even generalised emergency response plans. These convoys, of course, as has been said, are primarily the responsibility of the Ministry of Defence and the UK government. But being prepared for an accident involves local councils and other public bodies in Scotland. All public bodies who are Category 1 responders should be prepared. Our Gail and Butte Council did provide us with some information on its risk planning. That should be expected of the local authority, which also houses the naval bases containing these weapons. And Maurice Corey provided the debate with some useful information on the council's preparation in regards to the base. They've worked in partnership with other local councils like Eastern Bartonshire in their uh, regional risk partnership. But this generalised approach still falls short of a satisfactory risk assessment for nuclear convoys. To make matters worse, as Tom Arthur highlighted, Remshire Council, and they weren't alone, Western Bartonshire were another one, provided no information at all. Western Bartonshire instead stated that it's the responsibility of others, the Ministry of Defence, Police Scotland and the Scottish Government. Yes, they are all responsible. So is the local authority. Under the relevant legislation, Civil Contingencies Act of 2004, these councils are Category 1 responders. They're obliged to maintain an emergency plan. And not a single local authority in Scotland has an emergency plan for these convoys. Given that the convoys uh, cover a number of local authorities, the Scottish Government really has a, a role here, an opportunity to step in and coordinate a review of the preparedness of our uh, civilian authorities. We must ensure that all responsible bodies are prepared in the event that the worst should happen. This is not something that can or should be left to chance. It is not responsible to pass the buck to the Ministry of Defence when the Civil Contingencies Act places clear obligations on our civilian authorities as well. After all, what would happen in the event of an accident involving one of these convoys? Would the residents of Balloch or Alexandria or Dumbarton or Erskine or any of the other towns and villages that they pass through be well served by those they expect to serve them? My constituents should expect those responsible for their safety to be prepared. And given the convoys are a known risk, there is no good reason for councils across the Central Belt and the south of Scotland to be so completely unprepared for this specific risk. I hope that by raising this today, we can prompt them to take the actions that they should have done some time ago and to live up to their responsibilities for community safety. And I call Annabel Ewing to respond to the debate for around seven minutes or so. Please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I too congratulate uh, Mark Rusko on securing this important debate tonight. I think the importance of the issue is well illustrated by the uh, number of men members who sought to, to make their contributions to the debate. And in responding, uh, presiding officer, I wanted to reiterate at the outset that the Scottish Government is firmly opposed to the possession, threat and use of nuclear weapons. We are committed to the safe and complete withdrawal of Trident from Scotland and have repeatedly called on the UK Government to cancel plans for its uh, renewal. As has been noted in the debate, the responsibility for the transportation of nuclear warheads lies with the Ministry of Defence. The Scottish Government, however, expects any such transportation to be carried out safely and securely and has made this expectation clear to the UK government. Indeed, public safety is our absolute priority and we have sought assurances from the MOD that robust arrangements are in place to ensure the safety and security of the nuclear convoys at all stages of the transportation process. Whilst there has, as members have said, never been a defence nuclear transport incident posing a radiation hazard, I can well understand the concerns expressed by members tonight and indeed the public concern about these convoys. And I would like to take this opportunity, uh, presiding officer, to stress that we in the Scottish Government take the matter very, very seriously indeed. And that is why there is in fact very significant uh, resilience uh, planning in place. And I perhaps would like to take this opportunity to clarify uh, what that is, because I think there are certain misapprehensions about how that operates in Scotland. I, I think members might wish to note that in fact, Scotland's three regional resilience partnerships which include local authorities, but in fact are led by Police Scotland and indeed the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and supported by Scottish Government Resilience Coordinator teams. 
these uh, regional resilience partnerships are not woeful, are not in the position that no plans exist. Rather, uh, they undertake a risk and preparedness assessment process on a regular basis. In addition to that, this uh, kind of re resilience register work is moreover maintained on an ongoing basis. This enables the resilience partnerships to identify and assess the main risks relevant to the region and to determine how prepared they are to deal with the consequences of these risks. Does Yes, sure. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the Minister for outlining the work of the Resilience Partnerships? Does that work specifically include assessments and planning around nuclear convoys? Annabel Ewing. Yes, my understanding that that is indeed the case, that uh, the, the Resilience Partnerships look at uh, a number of risks, including obviously risks presented by nuclear uh, convoys. And therefore, whilst I understand Mark Ruskell's um, a, a determination to find out what is happening in Scotland. Um, I, I think that the re relying simply on, on the response or otherwise to his survey perhaps is not giving him the full picture. But I, 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 perhaps if I could continue, uh, presiding officer, the, the UK National Risk Assessment uh, and National Risk Register, as well as the Scottish Risk Assessment and Resilience Partnership Community Risk Register arrangements, all provide an evidence-based and priorities approach to risk at the UK, Scottish and local levels respectively. The National Risk Register produced by the UK Government is publicly available and seeks to inform the public about the range of risks that the UK may face. The Community Risk Registers are published by the three regional resilience partnerships to communicate the key risks for the North, East and West regions of Scotland. These also are publicly available and provide advice on what to do and who to contact in an emergency. In common with other countries, we in Scotland practice what's called the Integrated Emergency Management. This concept recognises that the most effective preparation for any event rests on planning for a range of consequences rather than the characteristics of a specific uh, event. The Scottish Government is satisfied that through the use of integrated emergency management, Police Scotland, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service as the lead uh, uh, agencies, organisations and working alongside local authorities are well prepared and other Category 1 responders are well prepared to deal with a diverse range of emergency uh, events. As I have already uh, 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 advice. It is indeed the Police and Fire and Rescue Service who take the lead uh, uh, in terms of resilience planning for nuclear convoys in Scotland. And whilst it is the case that local authorities as Category 1 responders, uh, as has been mentioned tonight, presiding officer, do indeed have a duty along with Police Scotland and the SFRS to warn the public and to provide information and advice if an emergency is likely to occur or has occurred, uh, and this under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004. Contingency Planning Scotland Regulations 2005. However, as has been said, in performing this duty, they must take account of the importance of not alarming the public unnecessarily. As far as the MOD is concerned, it maintains wider arrangements to respond to any incident, and that includes the Nuclear Emergency Organisation and the necessary contingency plans to deal with any incident. The MOD has provided assurance that the routes actually adopted are carefully selected as part of a rigorous risk assessment process and are regularly reassessed for their continued suitability. Moreover, the MOD has also provided assurance that operational planning always takes into account such factors as road and weather conditions. Presiding officer, given that we are not privy uh, to all the detailed information that the MOD bases these judgments on, we are of course not in a position to independently corroborate all of these assurances. As far as notice is concerned, the MOD provides this to Police Scotland and to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service but refuses to share details more widely on what they say are grounds of national security. As far as operational planning and guidance is concerned, it should be pointed out that Preparing Scotland provides guidance for any emergency, regardless of the particular cause. This guidance deals with preparing for, responding to, and recovering from emergencies in Scotland and forms the basis of emergency arrangements. This uh, takes cognizance of the MOD publicly available document entitled the Local Authority and Emergency Services Information, which provides information for emergency services, local authorities and health authorities on contingency arrangements to be implemented in what the MOD view as the unlikely event of an emergency during the transportation of defence nuclear material. As far as... Certainly. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President uh, Officer. And, and thank you, Minister, for taking the intervention. I mean, if you're seeking to reassure us, there's a huge gap between what you say, Minister, and what's in this report on Ready Scotland. Is that an issue that you would recognise has to be addressed by the Scottish Government, please? Always through the chair, please, Mr Finney. 
and in value. <laughs> um, yes, uh, well, in response to Mr. Finney, I'm just going to get on to, I'm trying to say where we are at the moment and what we, what we might be thinking of uh, going forward. Uh, but what I tried to say gently to Mr. Ruskell was, I understand that he, in good faith, conducted a survey and got the replies or not that he did. But what I'm saying is that the actual resilience structure is, is not quite as, therefore that would suggest, the resilience structure is not headed by the local authorities. The resilience structure actually at the very top, as the member will be aware, is headed by Police Scotland, right. working very closely with the SFRS, alongside within these re resilience uh, partnerships, uh, co uh, first responders like the local authorities. So I think understanding the structure is very important to therefore put that survey result Excuse in me, I'm still here. context. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> presiding officer. As far as emergency response arrangements are concerned, emergency services in Scotland have plans in place for responding to any major incident regardless of the cause. There are well established resilient structures in place to manage the consequences of any emergency. These structures have been and continue to be robustly tested and proven both by exercising and by real events. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has plans in place and has made pragmatic preparations to deal with incidents involving uh, defence nuclear material, including uh, convoys of such materials. Similarly, Police Scotland can give assurance that up-to-date plans are in place to deal with all major incidents, including nuclear incidents, and its procedures relating to defence nuclear material are current. Its resilient staff liaise regularly with the MOD Police on a range of matters. Presenting officer, in conclusion, uh, as I said at the outset, the Scottish Government believes that nuclear weapons are immoral, illegal and a colossal waste of money. We wish to see the Trident replacement programme scrapped and we have called, as I said repeatedly, on the UK Government to do that. Absent reclaiming power here for this Parliament, we in Scotland are reduced to being lumbered with whatever the UK Government decides. That is the unenviable position that Scotland is in, but hopefully not for too much longer. In the meantime, we see the transportation of nuclear weapons on our roads continue because we have no power to stop it. What the Scottish Government can do and do ensure is that we take our resilience responsibilities with the utmost seriousness. This is witnessed in our police and fire and rescue services ongoing resilience work and indeed in the work of the three regional resilience uh, partnerships. What I can though confirm tonight and I've listened very carefully to the concerns raised by members is that I will be writing to the uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and to Her Majesty's Fire Inspectorate for Scotland to ask that they consider now uh, conducting a joint review of such resilience work of Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and this would also be able to look at the close working arrangements with local authorities and the other responders in Scotland's regional resilience partnerships to ensure that response arrangements are indeed up to date and current because we all want to have that uh, assurance. So, presiding officer, I trust that uh, this will indeed uh, provide members who have participated tonight and indeed our, our guests in the gallery with some reassurance of the uh, very serious uh, approach that the Scottish Government takes to these matters. And in conclusion, I would say that, of course, and picking up a point that Bruce Crawford made, of course, as far as nuclear convoys are concerned. The only way to really deal with the issue once and for all is, of course, to ensure that powers over such matters lie with this parliament. That is to say, presiding officer, the powers of a normal, independent country. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.